other symptoms might they complain of? Am I, am yes, I might have difficulty passing the urine. Am I the urine? Am I the Yes, blood. Pain in passing the urine. Why might that be? Do you think? Why? Why should they have pain? It's, it's not the cancer that causes it so much. It's the constriction. It's the urinary tract infection because you've got outflow tract obstruction when you've got a greatly enlarged prostate, and it comes somewhat later in the disease. Um, so, secondary urinary tract infection. So, nobody mentioned none. That's actually the commonest symptom. Somebody's diagnosed with prostate cancer with a PSA, a prostate specific antigen, taken for some other reason or for screening, they have any symptoms. So, gentlemen, you're too young, you're too young. Actually, most of you are too young. Uh, however, the bad news is that many of you will get cancer from prostate. It's a common problem. It's a common cause of death. So that's not quite true. Most patients with cancer of the prostate in the West die of something else. But it's very common in men. You know, they say that patients of 90, and a group of men of 90, 90% of them have got some sort of prostate cancer. So, all the men now are very uh, listening very hard. The women are relaxing, because you're not going to get this. You have plenty of troubles of your own. However, you will almost certainly look after a patient with prostate cancer. And my experience of women doctors, you look after them very well. Very well indeed. So, none. Uh, so, frequency, painful urination, delay or hesitancy before urinating, the feeling that the bladder hasn't emptied completely. These are bladder neck obstruction type symptoms. Blood in the urine, uncommon. And it's when you get advanced, I'm sorry, am I speaking too quickly? No. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. Uh, because I tend to get a bit excited. Uh, by the way, I forgot to say, please interrupt. You can interrupt me if I'm not making it clear or I said something completely wrong. Uh, I do this, it's what happens when you get it It's when you get advanced prostate cancer, it's that's a very late symptom of any, any cancer, but bone pain and pains in the pelvis or the lower back, that's often related to bone pain or maybe hypnophrosis. So those are the symptoms you're going to look out for, hmm, a bit non-specific. And I, I see people writing, it's a good thing to write because it helps you remember, but don't forget you are the people who given this, always, it's yours. So, the next level, we talked about the symptoms, the next level of which the disease of prostate cancer shows itself, these are the levels of a disease showing itself, its manifestations, is the, sort of the level of signs. So, a correct examination will show an enlarged prostate. Anything else that will show? It will be enlarged and posterior lobe is enlarged and anything else on that? Uh, it may be tender, but something a little more significant. Sorry, somebody said something. Well, what do you feel? What do you feel like? Enlarged and hard. Maybe tender and hard. is good. Rock hard. And anything else? Irregular. irregular. So it's irregular. And you won't feel redness. Okay. To feel it, it will be irregular, hard, and possibly tender. And maybe some associated prostatitis. Is it the bladder? 
the downside. Um, I think Blender's down here somewhere. How about, how about that? It's a little bit difficult to tell with all the light coming in. I can't get the light rid of the light. <laughs> but that, and maybe that, compared to that.
But it's not for anything else, mainly, it's treatment. So your whole effort, your whole team is focusing on effective treatment for your patient. That's the bottom line. And so it's not good enough <coughs> just treating the symptoms, for example. <coughs> Who would treat this patient with cancer of the prostate with analgesics only? You want to take into account the whole manifestation of the patient's problems. <coughs> Sorry, forgive me. I've got a bad cough. So now we need to find, make a histological diagnosis. Clinically, it looks like prostate cancer. Yeah. But we need a histological diagnosis. Why do you think we need that? Yes, I have to confirm that. To confirm the diagnosis, yes, because some of your treatment's going to be quite radical, possibly. Any other reasons why you confirm histologically the diagnosis of malignancy? Right select the treatment. Yeah. Good. Okay, select the treatment. Okay. To determine if it's benign or. Yes, okay, the, the level of malignancy and the type of tumour. And it helps you with your prognosis, helps you with your staging, helps you explain to the patient what's going to happen. But we'll come to that in a minute. <coughs> okay, this is the grading system which is used for staging prostate cancers. Don't worry about the details. What I'm saying to you is that there's an internationally agreed standard of grading the malignancy of prostatic tumours. This relates to the prognosis and to a certain extent to the treatments that you will use. Okay, so the pathology of this patient, when we come down to the level of pathology, is prostate cancer. The 
it'll all get better. What should, she, what should she say? You'll be fine. It's just a little blood in the water. Don't worry. No, no. I tell you what. I know the invitation. I'm the patient. You're the oncologist. With the diagnosis? Yes, I know nothing. I've just had a lot of investigations. And I've had blood in my water, but I'm feeling all right apart from that. So you're the doctor, you may be the general practitioner, you may be the urologist. So doctor, what what what, what is it? Okay, you might want to get the patient seated and comfortable and try to present uh, the progression of the test and results that you have. Okay, that's a really good point. A little story. It started like this. We began to see this. It looked like that. Okay, I like the progression there. And then, based on that, you can give him your conclusion of what you suspect it is. You probably have met another specialist who confirmed your diagnosis. And then you present the patient with his options. Okay. You can leave it like this, it, it's benign, or if it's metastatic, or um, there are such procedures you can take. Okay, good. Okay, I'm going to stop you there. Goldwin. Yeah. Goldwin's presented this nice, steady, methodical, systematic, gentle work through. <laughs> well, bad news, I'm afraid, it's cancer. <laughs> or, there's nothing much wrong with you, but we'll soon sort you out. Or something like that. And confirmation of the diagnosis. Using colleagues again to make sure you know what is going on. You don't want to talk to the patient in ignorance, not knowing the full story yourself. You need to be prepared for this. Explaining what the situation looks like, and let's discuss now the treatment options. The seven-level model has two sides. One is the diagnostic side, and we've been working through that. The other side is the treatment side, because we need to have it. That's what the patient's come for. So, I know this doctor very well, and she says the biggest mistake you can make is to pretend to the patient that something is going to happen which is not going to happen, to give them false expectations. Because when that thing does happen, and they recognize that you have not exactly lied to them, but you haven't told them the whole truth, then your relationship is broken. And you can't help them anymore, or it's difficult for you to help them. And your presence is powerful. You, personally, without all the drugs, without all the surgery, you are powerful. Force for good, and for healing for this patient. Never underestimate the power of your presence. That will be particularly important as this patient's journey progresses and they come maybe near to dying. You don't know what to do. Don't underestimate the power of your presence with the patient. There are times when you can't do anything except be there. Be there. And when they've learned to trust you, they know they can trust you, your presence will be powerful. Doctors don't believe that. Believe me, it's true. So, okay, look, the patient is your brother, the patient is your father. Here's a doctor. What sort of qualities do you want this doctor to have? What sort of doctor should she be? Knowledgeable, knows what she's talking about. 
You can be as nice as you like, but if you're ignorant and you don't know what you're talking about, no good.
in the literature I'll give you on a stick, on a program, there's some papers from uh, about screening and about recent advances in the management of prostate cancer. That's full text articles for you to look at. I think that people don't know. And I think that prostate, the use of prostate-specific antigen as a screening test, different countries do different things. There are problems with overdiagnosis, worrying the patient, frightening the patient with false positives. Um, we don't quite know how to use it. Uh, different countries do different things. Do you know what, this, what happens in Ukraine? So I think we don't know about screening, but it's most likely the screening will be targeted at patients' relatives at greatest risk. So here's the patient. The patient's father died of prostate cancer. The patient's uncle died of prostate cancer. The patient's nephew has prostate cancer. What about the patient's sons? I think they're at risk. They should be screened. Yeah, I'm sure that's right. Um, and they should be screened early, probably in their 40s. Um, and I think the programs for screening and identification of the genetic markers of people at risk is still developing. I think we still don't quite know this. And some studies are in progress in many countries on this one. But I would focus on these people, early screening. Population screening, whether every man over the age of 50 should be screened, I don't think we know the answer to this. But watch this space. So, prevention screening. Then, what about dealing with the pathology and the disorders of structure? What have we got? Well, three main prongs, three main knives, if you like. And I'm not going to say much about this. But if you want to know how a, a radical prostatectomy is done, get that little website up. And it's a little animated prostatectomy. It's very simple, but you know, little, little animated knives snip off the vast difference snip around here. So, <coughs> in terms of surgical principles, if at all possible, you want to remove the tumour completely. That will depend on the staging of the tumour. Whether it's, whether it's gone outside the prostatic capsule, what it's doing, whether it's operable or not. So the, op the options are surgery, uh, radiotherapy, this is brachytherapy, so these are little seeds of radioisotope, uh, which will irradiate a small volume of prostate. Um, this, is, uh, this is actually quite technical. And I don't know how many centres are offering brachytherapy at the moment. Uh, this is an alternative to external beam radiotherapy. And chemotherapy, uh, it's not chemotherapy, uh, hormone therapy. And this is usually based on the uh, inhibition of the secretion of gonadotropin releasing hormone by LHRH analogues. And this is what this patient had, reducing the secretion of testosterone uh, by the testes, basically. There are a number of other drugs which work at various parts of the pathway. Some are experimental, some are in regular use. Uh, there, there's a nice website you can visit, which will tell you more about it. There's an article, which is a full text article, and that is in the handout, uh, the electronic handout that you can have. Okay, I don't want to go into all this, because I'm not an expert. Um, uh, I'm sure there's a urologist or someone here who's more about it than I do. So the patient started on... The, you saw that the tumour had extended well outside the prostatic capsule. It was actually involving the bones and maybe other soft tissues. So clearly surgery was not an option. Radiotherapy to the prostate isn't going to achieve that much the, <coughs> because the problem is widespread. So systemic treatment is required, and the patient started on whoops. The patient started on an uh, LHRH uh, releasing hormone analog, um, and later went on to docetaxel, uh, which is a, an anti-cancer agent, a chemotherapeutic agent. So I'm, I'm going to go through all this. What I'm saying to you is that each level of disease expression 
there is a therapeutic intervention. Okay. Sexual dysfunction is quite common, not as a result of the cancer, but as a result of the treatments. Either as a result of the surgery, or as a result of the medical walking because the patient has zero testosterone levels, and so will likely become, uh, have sexual dysfunction. I didn't mention these two levels at which the disease shows itself. The level of, dis the level of disabilities and the level of social effects. Because the treatments the patients receive for their cancer will have effects on patients' sexual function, sort of disability, and some effects on relationships. When I was a medical student, we didn't think about that. As far as we were concerned, this, is, this was the disease, this was the problem. You, we didn't think, think about that at all. But that's part of the patient's disease, part of the patient's problems. And you may need somebody else in the team to help you with those. If you're the generalist here, you are the conductor of the orchestra. That's the way it should work in my view. You are the conductor and you draw in the specialists. But you are the one who will have a closest relationship with the patient and you will want to make sure that all these other levels are being treated. Now we've gone through the levels of the second level model, uh, both therapeutic and diagnostic. For the physical dimension, there's something I haven't told you. Patients sweating. Patients sweating. Patient has some signs, has a tremor, a tachycardia. What sort of disorder of function do you think this is? How do you explain this physiologically?
Okay. So we've gone through two dimensions now. We've gone through the physical dimension and the psychological dimension. Because human beings, your patients in our body, they are mind. I just ask you, what do you think is a connection? Why is it important to diagnose this question? Does it matter? Or is it just you? Know? Why my father? Why my brother? What does it mean? That 
question is a spiritual question. It's not a physical or a psychological question. The next dimension is a connectedness. Being connected with yourself, knowing yourself, accepting yourself, recognizing yourself with other people. And with something outside. It may be nature, God, the Communist Party, I don't know. Something. But it's usually a higher being. Connectedness. And lastly, it has to do with energy and emotions. So, direction and guidance coming from outside yourself, some other being, power made accessible to you, has to do with peace, forgiveness, and hope for the future. These are, these are, these are areas of spirituality. Do you think I'd say that? Or did you think I'd say, well, it's Christianity? Or it's Buddhism? Or it's Hinduism? Or something like that? Each major world religion has elements of this. Uh, and so when I'm talking about spiritual care, and we're going to have a session on that probably later on today, religion and religious practice is in it, but it is not all of it. It is bigger than that. Okay, so what symptoms might indicate this patient has a spiritual problem? What do you think you might notice? What might he say? Okay. Depression. Yeah, so what, 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 would, what would he say, do you think? He'd be asking questions about messes on like why is did he do anything? Yes, okay. Yeah. That's a common question. Is it something I did? I feel guilty about the way I did such and such. Is God punishing me? Yes. Any other sorts of things that make you suspicious? This is not just physical, not just psychological, it's something else. I say something like, I'm finished. Yeah. yeah, I'm finished, that's the end. A whole range of things, hopelessness. So there's no hope for me. I'm finished. Despair. Nothing. Nothing. I am alone. There's nobody to help me. I feel completely and utterly cut off from everything and everybody and cut off from God. Disconnected. I've lost my sense of wonder at the world, at relationships and everything. I've lost it. I can't forgive. Forgiveness is a crucially important problem in this world and it has important effects on your cardiovascular system. There's evidence to suggest that your cardiovascular blood supply is very susceptible to unforgiveness associated with anger. So does that mean we should prescribe forgiveness? <laughs> hey, that's a great question. That's a really good question. Because how are you going to manage these problems? It's not good identifying a problem, you can't do something about it. Don't forget, particularly when it comes to hopelessness, you cannot give what you do not have. You cannot give what you do not have. If you do not have hope, you can't give it to you. So you're thinking now, how can I give hope to my patient? How can I going to deal with that? Discussing this more with bitterness, meaninglessness. What's the meaning of this? It's all meaningless. Life is meaningless. There's no purpose. It means nothing. Have you heard patients say that? You've heard people say that? What is it? Loss of values. Okay. So we're getting on now to your patient. Suspect there's something going on, something spiritual going on. He's depressed, or below. So, how do you take a spiritual history? We haven't got time to deal with that now. But one thing you need is to be there, to be fully present. I don't mean, you know, yes, I'm listening to you. Yeah, what was that problem you see just now? Yeah, I can help you with you in a minute. Sorry, that's fully present. Have you ever been to a party or meeting somebody?
Henry, and uh, they're talking to you, and they're looking over your shoulder all the time. They're not actually listening to you at all. They're looking over here somewhere, and you think, you are not listening to me. Be present. Make it safe for the patient to discuss their fear. And if they are a Christian patient, or any other religion, their fear, the thing they won't want to say is, I lost my faith. I lost my faith. They will not want to say that. My time finishes at four o'clock, yes?